welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ, the podcast. I believe that the best coach you can ever have is that one person that is staring straight back at you every morning in the mirror, you. Join me in discovering some key strategies so that you can create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs. Your journey to being your own best coach starts right now. Welcome back, everyone, to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. I am thrilled to have the amazing Barry Dubois with us today. Now, Barry is an Australian designer, building expert, and a TV personality who is currently co-host on Channel 10's Logie Award-winning lifestyle program, The Living Room. Barry ran a successful design, building and property development business business until retirement in 2005 and in 2011 hosted Network 10's renovation series, The Renovators, before joining lifestyle program, The Living Room in 2012, alongside Amanda Keller, Dr. Chris Brown and Miguel Maestro, as well as fronting The Renovation King. Dubois works tirelessly for many charities and is a member of the board of Are You OK Day and is also a passionate advocate for Cancer Council Australia and a firm believer in environmental sustainability. Barry's married to Leone and is the father to twins, a son and a daughter, born in 2012. He was diagnosed with plasma cytoma, a cancer of the immune system in 2010 and underwent successful therapy but in 2017 the cancer returned as multiple myeloma. I'm thrilled and honoured to have Barry Dubois with us today to share his story and wisdom. Welcome Baz. JJ, what an introduction that is. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. It's like a, I, I had to, I tried to, I didn't have time to put a breath in, I don't think. <laughs> I think that's only the last 10 years of my life as well. So that's incredible, isn't it? You get a lot done, don't you? You absolutely do. Look, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me and the listeners today. Now, I'm looking, I, I've read your book and I absolutely love it, Life Force. And I want to start at the beginning. Now, you were, you were a Sydney-born boy and uh, you came from humble beginnings with your, with your parents who saved every penny for your annual holiday. And, then, and from there, you grew up and established your own design building and property development business that was so successful that you were able ret- to retire at an early age. So what, what were your keys to success in business? Well, you know, I was very lucky growing up, like you said, humble beginnings, that's for sure. My dad was an incredibly hard worker, though, and, and he had incredible self-belief in himself and, and our family, and family was very important to us. So from a very young age, I believe you could be whatever you wanted to be. Uh, it just took hard work and, uh, and a bit of common sense, and dad instilled that in us. So, and, he, you know, he supported us with whatever we wanted to do. I, I wasn't very well educated. I was, uh, bit, bit, I, I had dyslexia so the 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 current school system and the school system that i had back then didn't really suit kids that are a little bit outside of the the standard uh so i i had to learn uh, how to how to use my own wits because i wasn't getting a lot from school and then um with that with a bit of confidence and a little bit of skills in my hand i was able to build a business that was uh, reasonably successful i will say though in all honesty the reason I retired in 2005, 2006, I was I was successful financially, but mentally, I was in a I was in a dark hole. I was, uh, you know, I was I was very dark, and uh, and and I had a pretty pretty manic depression. My my mum had died. My wife got cancer. We couldn't have children. Um, yeah, there, there was a lot of things going on in my life, and uh, and they all manifested up into a um, to a bad to a bad mental health situation for me. So I yeah. remember, I always remembered that uh, I, I I always said when when I get to where I want to be, I'm going to sort of sail around the Australia. I said back then. Uh, so I and and my dad was really struggling. So I said, "Come on, Dad, we're going to go to Paris and we're going to buy a big yacht and we're going to sail at home uh, to Sydney." So that was um, that. That was why I retired. I, I could. I also had a pretty good inclination that there was going to be a bit of a financial crash, and uh, so I sold out a lot of my assets and a lot of my stocks and shares. 
and um, and then the market did crash, and then I was able to position myself really well for retirement. Yeah, beautiful. And I love, you know, when you're talking about your dad, I've actually got this down, you know, reading about the influence that your dad had. And, th- and two things really stand out for me, Baz. Like one is the belief that he had in you and his family and saying something like, you know, you're a Dubois, you can do anything. And it, and it really resonated with me because my dad used to say when he was alive, he used to say to me, you know, there's no such word as can't, you know. Right. You, you, the, you you can do anything. Um and the other thing that stands out for me, Baz, is also the personal integrity that your dad had. You know, yeah. when you tell the story of uh, your fam- your mum and dad saving up pennies for, for you to go on your annual holiday and then going to the fruit and veg shop and getting too much change back and then driving four and a half hours and your dad saying, realising that you've got too much change from the fruit and veg guy and then yeah. deciding to drive all the way back to yep. give that change back like that really that you can't teach that stuff in school can you well you can't teach it in school but you can teach it in life uh, the couple of things yeah. said, i think uh we use can't in this society for a lot of things these days and that's too hard and uh and i believe if you tell a child that he can do anything maybe he'll try and do anything he might not succeed at everything but he might enjoy the challenge uh, or he or she might enjoy the challenge and if you say, no, I don't think you can do that or that's too dangerous or that's too scary or that's uh, above your mean, you, you're going to teach your kid to fail. That's what I think. So, um, uh, and I have to say, I mean, the, the same said for my own children. I, I've got the twins. They're very different personalities, but they uh, they both believe in themselves and each other and our family, and, and that's really important to me. That is so beautiful. And, and coming from from from... Yeah, retiring from business. How did you transition into television? It was an interesting story. I touched on it briefly, but a lot of people talked about how they knew there was going to be a financial crisis after the fact, but very few people actually acted in any significant way to prepare for that. Uh, it's documented about a thousand people in the whole world, you know, sold significant or all of their assets just prior to the to the crash. Well, I was one of those people. I liquidated literally everything I owned, and um, and uh, and I on on the bet that the market was about to fail, and and I was right. So, Business Review Weekly did a story on that, and uh, at the same time, um, uh, a friend of mine, John Harker, knew someone who was casting for the Renovators, and he said uh, he said that. Um, it, this guy would be good for that show. He's a good mentor. He knows building like, you know, anybody. And uh, and he's, he says what he thinks. And he says what he thinks and he, he's not scared to say it. And as it happens, there's a guy, uh, he's, he's my, one of my closest friends, Peter Cahoon from Better Homes and Gardens. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, well, he, uh, because I was on the yacht overseas, he'd come over and visit a couple of times. And while he was there, he would take videos. He had this crazy scheme how him and I could sail into great cities that had changed the history of the world we live in and we could document that and make a tv show of it so um john harker showed um showed the producers of the renovators that footage and they said yeah that guy's perfect that's the guy we want you know and they rang me up a couple of times i said no i'm not interested in doing tv i think it's for mugs and people that are up and stuff uh, and, uh but as it happens I, I haven't told this story too many times but on the day that i was diagnosed with cancer uh, the first time they gave me three months to live, and straight after I got that news, the casting uh, agent rang for the sixth time to say we'd do anything to have you on this show. And I said, I'll tell you what, ring me up in three months. If I answer the phone, I'll do it. And the rest, <laughs> is, history. The rest is history, I guess. Wow. And uh, you know, I, I, my family and I have watched you and the car, the rest of the cast on the living room, and you feel like family to us. Uh, there's times where our our cheeks have hurt from laughing so much at you guys, but then there's been times where we have cried. My husband and I sitting there crying with puffy eyes and a box of tissues. Uh, you know, you're really living your life in the spotlight, like it or not, uh, and you have gone on such a, a big health journey, like even from 2000 when you had that 14-metre fall 
off a beachfront apartment. And then 10 years later, you get plasmacytoma, the cancer of the immune system. In 2017, the cancer comes back. How have you, how have you navigated through those health challenges? Everybody that's listening to, to this podcast goes through challenges. And, and yeah. a severe challenge to, to someone might be slightly different to you, but we all face extremes every single day. That's a fact of life. And, and I've always had the belief, I was a boxer, so I know that uh, if you're going to step into the ring, there's three steps. Are really, uh, It's a big journey, those three steps. And if you're not prepared and you haven't trained and you haven't done all the work, you're going to get knocked out. Now, life's the same. Uh, every day you've got to step up the three steps and get in the ring with the rest of the world. And that's disease, that's heartbreak, that's emotion. It's all those things. So just have a good balanced life and be as prepared mentally, physically and, and, and uh, nutritionally. And you'll take on most challenges, uh, regardless of how extreme they may seem to someone else. Yeah, and and you talked about depression before, and from to in your book you say from two thousand and two thousand and eight you drifted in and out of depression, and one of the things you said was I was trying to control everything to spin not just my plates but everyone else's as well, and I know you you mentioned that the challenges that you went through from you know the agony that that you were going through with your fall that your mum passed away that um, your beautiful wife Leonie was miscarrying and have had cervical cancer i mean what mm. what helped you through that depression well as i said you don't wake up monday morning and you're depressed it takes it takes a whole series of events to happen or you know different for different people and then and then what happens is that balance that i just spoke of you start to not eat as well. You start to not train as much. You start to not give you as much um, emotional uh, relaxation. And then it, then, it, then it manifests into something that you can't get hold of. And for me, when I couldn't control my life, I tried to control even more the lives of everybody around me. Well, that's an impossibility. So what you've effectively done is set yourself up to fail. And, and that failure, in a sense, is what we call depression. It's um, you set a goal much too high for yourself that you can't achieve, and um, uh, and you feel like I said I describe it as very dark. You feel that everybody's against you, and um, uh, but you know, but it takes a long time to get into that state. And then once you realise, I guess it's like any disease. Once you realise you've got it, and you can admit that, and then you can start saying, well, a walk a day is going to get me closer to a, a, a jog every day, and then. A, you know, and a walk on the beach will get me closer to a swim and then I'll feel like eating better food. And, and you know, for me, it was sailing. Sailing was a, a, a mental um, a mental um, advocate, well, not advocate, but it was like a medicine for me. Sailing, having to control the boat and myself and nothing more. It was, uh, it allowed me just to put things back into perspective. When you sail from one country to another, you, it, it's, a, it's a great way to get perspective on life, you know. Or, or get a real yeah. perspective on life. Yeah. I remember one of the things I have a challenge with as a coach, Baz, is I remember uh, is labelling how quickly some people, even some doctors, label depression, particularly even in kids. And for me, I had an experience as uh, years ago before I've got a 22 year old son right now but before that I I miscarried I was seven and a half months pregnant and yeah. so I had to deliver a stillborn baby boy Raymond uh, and after I went through that experience I was having cramps in my stomach and I remember going to the doctor and the doctor saying to me that you are depressed and I and I wasn't a coach at that stage but what I knew in that moment was that I was grieving yeah. and, the, and the, the doctor kept saying, you're depressed. And I said, no, I, I actually don't think I am. I'm, I'm grieving right now. Like I've just lost my baby. And I remember her giving me a script for Valium. Uh, and Baz, I, I don't, I've been brought up to, I don't even take a Panadol unless I've got a really bad headache. So I went home, I screwed up the script uh, and but I, it really stuck with me because in my head I, I thought, wow, it could easily have been. She was telling me that I really believed that I wasn't depressed in a time where I was grieving, 
Uh, and we went through that same stage with my son when he was going through some anxiety and we took him to the um we took him to a place where they were talking to him and and they said, Oh, you're depressed. And I straight away said, Hold on a moment. <laughs> and it just brought back that memory of labeling someone so quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about uh, your experience 23 years ago or so, but uh, 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 and, and that is, you know, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? I mean, you were depressed. There's no doubt about the fact you were depressed, but what is depression to you is not necessarily what we call a clinical depression, and, and, and yeah. 9 out of 10 times, it definitely medication is not going to solve that problem. If you're exhausted and you needed some sleep, maybe uh, a Valium uh, for one day of your life might help you get that back in balance. But the only way to get sleep balance is to sleep properly. The only way to sleep properly is to eat good food and exercise. Uh, that's what gets you back in the balance. I mean, I, I you know, I think doctors, doctors are amazing, but uh, there was a period, especially 20 years ago, and 25, where it was just too easy to, to medicate people for anything and everything. Uh, everything. Yeah. And I, and I think the same thing where, where, where we live a life of, uh, of, of drugs these days. I mean, the average person's taking something for everything. Yeah. One thing that I'm really passionate about, Baz, is, you know, I think about schooling and, you know, there, there's subjects that we must take at school, like English, math, science, and it always stumps me to think, why are we not having a subject of mindset? Like, you know, because I think it's so important for us to educate kids because it starts when we're a kid of how we can empower our thoughts and our mindset. What are your thoughts around that? I mean, I have a, a foundation uh, uh, called uh, Co-Innovate and it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a foundation where I put together uh, um, people to solve community problems. And, and I, I mean, I'll start again. The, the the classroom, the, the school itself, it's a bit of a uh, it's a, a very misunderstood thing. What the edu what education is and what school is. If you remember, a couple of hundred years ago, we had u a, a university type system. Before the industrial revolution, you would be mentored by your peers, and you would challenge your peers, and everybody would grow. That's sort of how it is at university now, or, or to an extent, because. Um, corporate uh, money controls a lot of uni what university teaches these days as well. But what happened when we had the Industrial Revolution, um, it didn't, uh, we, we, most of us lived in villages and, um, and uh, what would happen is to, to earn money, the, the men particularly had to leave the village and go away and work as a part of the Industrial Revolution, a part of the industrial machine that, that we were experiencing. Well, it didn't take men long to work, to work out. They weren't really earning a lot of money and the, the cost of living because their away was a lot higher. But even more importantly than that, they weren't able to spend time with their family uh, and children and, and pass on the skills that they'd learned. So they started to rally together and form things which would be called a union now uh, and say, OK, we're happy to do this, but we need some rights. We need you know, a better medical system for our children, this, that and the other. This is a long history lesson put into a few seconds, but but it didn't take very long for the the elite of community to say to government, hey, you better knock this on the head. These people don't want to work for nothing. They're going to be paid fairly. We're going to have to teach them a more subservient uh, behaviour. So um, so what they started to do was uh, started what we know now as the education system, and basically uh, that whole system was set up to teach subservient behaviour and to do whatever you're told, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, for example, your mum and dad and my mum and dad would have gotten a cane if they if they used their left hand. And that's they did, yep. And it was purely because it wasn't it didn't suit the machinery that they were going to be using later in life. And that's why wow. that, and, and it's also why the teacher sat above the children because you had to look up to the teacher and that's how you saw respect. And and in all those early factories, the foreman sat in an office above the workers. It was just about teaching subservient behaviour. Now, sure enough, we've developed, we've added band-aids like teaching um, um, science and maths and English to a better extent. But effectively, the education system, in my, in, my, in my belief, is basically a square wheel 
with a whole lot of band-aids on it but it, it's always going to be a square wheel because we don't teach things like philosophy and 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 the things that are required for life and the simple fact is we put kids into school too early as well where they where yeah they, they need the family unit whatever that is and you've got two, two beautiful children bennett and arabella and i know there was such a challenge having children for many years and then you looked at surrogacy um yeah. there's been some with COVID 19 have have both bennett bennett and arabella been uh enjoying homeschooling Oh, they've thrived. I mean, uh, Bennett's like me. He, he doesn't read and write as well as the average person. So that's the school. I mean, I love his little school. I think they're incredible and they're, they're quite forward thinking. But in in the three or the couple of months they've had off and been homeschooled, Bennett's lifted out of the class. Uh, he's up into the advanced area of the class now and uh, he's enjoying learning more. I think they've really thrived. Uh, children will thrive on more uh, m more time with family. It's as simple as that, especially if the family puts in the effort uh, and are capable of putting in the effort. Not everybody's capable. I'm a, we're a very lucky family. I, I work, my wife does a little bit of part-time work, but throughout this period, we, we would, she was just dedicated to the children and I got to spend a lot more time with them. So that's an ideal situation. Not everybody's in that situation. I understand that, but... Uh, yeah, I think you've worked out. I'm not a huge fan of the school system, and I think uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, it, it works for some people. It really does. But it doesn't work for you if you're a little bit off the Richter, so to speak. Yeah. Well, my son, my son left school at 15, and I had to say though, Baz, I think you know when you've grown up with values and and what you what's what the society says is right and wrong. We really held on to like trying to push him back into school, but he has learnt so much more out of school, <laughs> and he is an insatiable learner. He's always learning, so for well, him, school wasn't the place. Me too, though. I mean, I I left at fifteen. I couldn't read and write. I, I I've it's in my book. I think you know I couldn't yeah. spell a million when I wrote my first million dollar check. Uh, I didn't know how to spell that. I, I just wrote an M and just did some scribble because I didn't know I could add. I could add it up and tell you how you know the, 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 uh, anything about the math. So, but I could not write that word. Uh, and um, you know, I didn't get anything out of school, and I did all right. And 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 that's the thing. We need. We, we try to raise individuals, but we want to teach them all exactly the same thing. And my daughter learns completely different to my son. It's incredible. Yeah. And how have you gone with, and I love in your book you say that you like to control everything. <laughs> and then I thought of COVID-19 and I thought, how's Baz going with COVID-19 when he wants to control everything? <laughs> so how have you gone through the whole COVID-19 scenario? You know, I uh, I have my own beliefs that they're my beliefs, but I, I I'm a part of a society, and and I've conformed with what society says to do. I, I'm not sure I believe uh, all that was required, but uh, I can say you know I can say that in hindsight, at the very beginning of all this, I was really concerned. But uh, you know, I work in the media, and I think the media loves to hype things up. But uh, but, uh, yeah. The ratings are good if we're all worried, but uh, I'll probably get the sack for that. But, uh, nah, but you, know, we're, I think you've got, you know, there was something new. We had to be very cautious. And uh, and so I, I, I meet the protocols of what our, our leaders or our, our peers um, suggested. We, we, we've done everything we've been told to do. Yeah. The one thing that concerns me, and I know that we chatted before about this, Baz, is that experts are now saying that they're fearing that suicide can increase because of COVID-19 with people having the lack of personal contact, um, losing their jobs. Uh, no, you know, that's a huge suicide, concern for me. Suicide has definitely increased in this three-month period. It's definitely on the uh, it's very high. Domestic violence is very high. Uh, there, there is, I think the, the, the level of fear in a community through misinformation from both sides has um has uh has, has been a really um it's we're going to be paying for this for a long time that's for sure. yeah and i know when you talked in your book about depression you also you mentioned this statement which really stuck with me and it and you said a darkness where nothing else existed yeah. uh and suicide for me is it's a permanent decision based on temporary events and feelings mm. and 
when I first started as a coach, I was I was so shocked as how many people that came to me either had suicidal thoughts or had attempted suicide. And I'm looking at this beautiful human in front of me thinking, thank goodness you did not succeed. Um, and just looking at the the numbers and, and as you said, Baz, they've, they've increased since um, COVID-19, but looking at the um, 3,000 people that die each year, which is 8.3 deaths by suicide a day in Australia. Yeah, but that's sure. just heartbreaking. Yeah, well, it's a lot higher than that at the moment. Uh, and uh, yeah. But, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. That's another podcast. I mean, but you're right. Uh, what you just described there, that darkness, what I described, I should say, I mean, that's effectively where we've all been put at the moment. We've been put into an isolation and a darkness uh, where, and there's, you know, a lot of people, as I said, you don't wake up depressed. It takes you a bit of time to go into it and it'll take uh, a long time to come out of it as well. And, and I think that's how it's going to be for a lot of people. But I encourage yeah. people, if there's anybody listening, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it is just another day and it's uh, another day and another day after that. And if you can just have a look at making today, prepare today to be a better tomorrow, you'll do okay. Yeah. And you're, you, you're involved with Are You OK Day, which is on the 10th of September this year. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm on the board of Are You OK. I'm a proud ambassador yeah. as well. I try and share my story of depression with people and uh, how I came out of it and how it's... Uh, it's terribly important to realise that there is light at the tunnel and how important it is if you're feeling down uh, to you know, raise that with someone. But, but more, more importantly with Are You OK is if you see someone that you feel is acting out, ask them if they're OK because it's, the onus shouldn't be put on the person who's suffering to say, I'm not doing OK. Because I know me personally, when you asked me if I was doing OK, I said, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I'll worry about you. And that, that's, you know, that's one of the triggers that manifests into a deeper, darker spot. So if you see someone that's out of sorts or acting differently, not dressing as well, not, you know, hygiene maybe down there, so everybody can pick their friends when they're feeling down. Don't be scared. Ask the question. And, and you can just say it like that. Hey, I've been struggling lately. How are you doing? And then they, that, that yeah. might start a conversation. And that. They might not manifest any further. They might start to come out of that depression before they go into it, and that would be a great thing. Yeah, beautiful. And so how do you now look after your physical and mental health? Like what habits or strategies do you have, Baz? I mean, I just leave a balanced life. Like I said, I don't try and balance too many plates. I balance my own plate, and my family is a part of that plate. But to do that, I need good sleep, and I need to be as healthy and ready for anything that comes along. So we eat well. We try and exercise as much as possible. We breathe fresh air. I try not to take too many chemicals, and um, and, um, and 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 you know, just just. Just don't let things build up in a negative way. Uh, as I said, I, I was, I've been an investor my whole life. I've never, I, I found out a long time ago that there's not a good dividend or no return for those who aren't investors. You don't get any return for a negative investment or a negative thought. Yeah. You, only get, you only get a return for a positive uh, thought. And, and, and what I mean by that is if you're walking down the street and you look at someone and you snarl at them, give them negativity, they'll walk away from you or snarl back. But if you smile at someone, they'll smile back. Uh, if they don't, you've lost nothing. But if they do, that investment got you a return, didn't it? Yeah, beautiful. And what's your personal legacy? you got a legacy. What do you want to be remembered for? I often think about this for myself. Oh, I'd like to be remembered uh, for being kind and honest and, uh, and raising two of the most beautiful children on earth, two of the most beautiful, beautiful. humans on earth. Yeah. They are Love our, it. Our children are our legacy, and the lessons that you give them are the legacy you learn with them. And and you know, my dad didn't have many rules, but he stuck to them: integrity, honesty, and a work ethic. You know, um, and 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 help others because it doesn't matter how you're doing, uh, you, you can always help someone else. Beautiful. And your book, Life Force, is out. Where? How do? You, how will the guys get your book, Life Force? Yeah, it's um, I just I think we just did a reprint, but you can go online and order that uh, through all the big bookstores that got it. Um, I'll um, I'll actually get in touch with that and give you a link and, uh, and yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll wonderful. Go back to that one. 
And the living room starting on July 3rd. I cannot wait. The living room's coming back July 3rd. I mean, you said that it felt like you were sitting with uh, your family, uh, but that's how we feel. The four of us are like family. We're incredibly different people, but we love each other dearly. And uh, we've, we've changed the living room up. It's the living room 2020. It's uh, We've got ourselves a home base where we hang out and uh, we have a lot of fun there. But we, we're doing a lot more of the, uh, uh, when we're finding people who are in need, we, we, we're doing it together. Amanda and I go out and meet them and Chris and Miguel and I will work together either in the travel or the home renovation or the, or the cooking side of it. But uh, we're getting to hang out together a lot more. I've never laughed so much in my life. So, and, you know, like you said, you have a, you'll have a smile. You'll have a smile on your face if you watch, I promise. You could even shed a tear, but you, either way, you'll have enjoyed your hour. Oh, beautiful. Now I'm going to finish off. I've loved interviewing Baz. I could, I could interview you for five hours, to be honest. Um, but I've got ten rapid-fire questions for you before we finish off. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so your first one is, who would play you in a movie? Richard Gere. Ah, <laughs> oh, perfect. What's your favourite book? Uh, at the moment, it's Dark Emu. What is it? Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe. Dark Emu. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, Bruce Pascoe, amazing. Not that I'm much of a reader. Yeah. <laughs> What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Oh, you haven't got enough time. I've done it all. <laughs> I've jumped off mountains. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've done it all. Uh I, I, one of my most enjoyable experiences is single-handedly sailing from Sicily to Africa. And then uh, if you read the book, you'll see when I woke up, I thought I'd been um, taken over by pirates, which didn't exist. But uh, yeah. that, that was, it was this, it's one of, uh, and the crossing, uh, a crossing of the, of the um, uh, from Hobart back to Sydney um, in 50-foot seas and 80-knot 80, uh, 80 winds was uh it was a pretty terrifying time. Uh, it was a time where I, for one of the first times in my life, said that uh, I've had enough. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, I remember reading that. <laughs> uh, if you had to trade, if you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? I wouldn't. You wouldn't. Beautiful. No, wouldn't out, of Amanda, Miguel, out of Amanda, Miguel and Chris, who has the most annoying habit and what is it? I love them all dearly. Uh, Miguel, uh, sorry, Amanda is just too funny. Chris is just too handsome. And Miguel <laughs> is just too loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Miguel. Um, what's one thing on your bucket list? Uh, to, to raise the most beautiful humans on earth. Beautiful. Three words that describe you? I'd like to think uh, tenacious, uh, honest and integrity. Love it. And what would be your last supper? Oh, whatever, whatever my family was eating. <laughs> uh, what's the best piece of advice that's been given to you? Believe in yourself and help others. Love it. And I'll, the last I'll, question. I, I will add two things to that because it's what was yep. my favourite thing is everything that you do, you can do 10% better. And I've never made a mistake in my life. It's just a shitload of things I'm not going to do again. <laughs> Beautiful. And, yeah, I, I read that in your, in your book when you said, and I loved when your dad said um, that, he, you know, he breaks things down into small pieces, how, how you can do anything if you break it down to small pieces. That's a great piece of advice. Um, and the last... It doesn't matter if it's a multi-storey building or a problem in your head. If you break it down into smaller problems, you can achieve... You can overcome the little problems and all of a sudden the, the building is built or the problem's gone away. Absolutely. And the last question for you, Baz, is describe your life in one word. The best. The best. I love it. Thank you so much, Baz, for your time today. I know we, we uh, you know, you're a very busy man and I really so appreciate your time and I know that all your your beautiful wisdom that you've shared today will help many people that are listening today. And I would encourage anyone to get on to uh, Are You OK Day, get on the site and get involved because it's coming up yeah. to September. Um, and But every day we need to be saying to our friends and our families and strangers, 
yeah. are you okay and open up that discussion and uh, I really respect you, Baz, with the work that you do and the journey that you've been on. So thank you so much for sharing the time with me and the listeners today. You're very kind. We'll have another chat at another day. You take care. Thanks, Baz. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and follow me on Instagram at JJ Speaker Coach. And remember to live with insatiable passion, create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs.